Volume Three, Chapter Four of That Unfortunate Marriage by Francis Eleanor Trollope. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Four. Although the little house in Collingwood Terrace had not perhaps fully justified Martin's cheery prophecy that it would turn out an awfully jolly little place when once they got used to it, yet there, as elsewhere, peace, goodwill, order, and cleanliness mitigated what was mean and unpleasant. Mrs. Bransby's love of personal adornment rested on a better basis than vanity, although she was doubtless no more free from vanity than many a plainer woman. She had an artistic pleasure in beauty and elegance, and an objection to sluttishness in all its protean forms, which might almost be described as the moral sense applied to material things. Her delicate taste suffered, of course, from much that surrounded her in the squeezed little suburban house, but far from sinking into a helpless slattern, according to the picture of her painted by mrs dormer smith's commonplace fancy she exerted herself to the utmost to make a pleasant and cheerful home for her children her life was one of real toil although many well-meaning ladies of the dormer smith type would have looked with suspicion on the care mrs bransby took of her hands and would have been able to sympathize more thoroughly with her troubles if her collars and cuffs had occasionally shown a crease or a strain mr rivers room had been prepared with the most solicitous care it was a labor of love with all the family martin and his sister ethel did good work and even the younger children insisted on helping to the irreparable damage of their pinafores and temporary eclipse of their rosy faces by dust and black lead the young ones were elated by the prospect of seeing their playfellow owen once again martin relied on his assistance to persuade mrs bransby that he martin should and could earn something and even mrs bransby could not help building on owen's arrival to bring some amelioration into her life beyond the substantial assistance of his weekly payments he arrived in the evening and was received by the children with enthusiasm and by mrs bransby with an effort to be calm and cheerful and to suppress her tears which touched him greatly seeing her as he did for the first time in her widow's garb he was touched too by her almost humble anxiety that he should be content with the accommodation provided for him and earnestly assured her that he considered himself luxuriously lodged and indeed for himself he was more than satisfied but he could not help contrasting this mean little house with mrs bransby's beautiful home in oldchester and he found it singularly painful to see her in these altered circumstances in this respect as in so many others his feeling differed as widely as possible from theodore's for theodore although fastidious and exacting as to all that regarded his own comfort sincerely considered his stepmother's home to be in all respects quite good enough for her and had privately taxed her with insensibility and ingratitude for showing so little satisfaction in it all the family including phoebe who grinned a recognition from the top of the kitchen stairs agreed in declaring owen to be looking remarkably well he was somewhat browned by the spanish sunshine and he had an indefinable air of bright hopefulness in oldchester he used to look more dreamy it is business which is grinding my faculties to a fine edge he answered laughingly when mrs bransby made some remark to the above effect i shall become quite dangerously sharp if i go on at this rate i don't think you look at all sharp replied mrs bransby gently whereupon martin told his mother that she was not polite and bobby and billy giggled and they all sat down to their evening meal very cheerfully when this table was cleared and the younger children had gone away to bed under ethel's superintendence mrs bransby said you smoke do you not mr rivers not here in your sitting-room oh pray do it does not annoy me in the least owen hesitated and martin thereupon put in his word mother does not mind it really not decent human kind of tobacco such as gentlemen use that beast old butcher used to smoke a great pipe that smelt like a double distilled essence of public-house tap-rooms well a cigarette if i may said owen pulling out his case then drawing the only comfortable easy-chair in the room towards the fireside he asked is that where you like to have it that is your chair said mrs bransby timidly good heavens exclaimed owen genuinely shocked what have i done to make you suppose i could possibly be capable of taking your seat he gently took her hand and led her to the chair then looking round the little parlour he spied a footstool which he placed beneath her feet as he looked up from doing so he saw her sweet pale face with the delicate curves of the mouth twitching nervously in an endeavour to smile and the soft dark eyes full of tears you must not spoil me in this fashion she began but the attempt to speak was too much for her she broke down and covered her face with her trembling hands martin instantly crossed the room and stood close beside her placing one arm round her shoulders and turning away from owen so as to fence his mother in the boy's protecting attitude was pathetically eloquent 
and so was the way in which his mother presently laid her head down upon his shoulder they remained thus for a little while owen stood by the fire with his elbow on the mantelpiece and his forehead resting on his hand all three were silent at length when martin felt that his mother was no longer trembling and that her sobs were subsiding he looked round and said mother's upset by being treated properly no wonder it's like meeting with a white man after living among cannibals if you had ever seen that beast butcher you'd understand it shall i go away asked owen mrs bransby quickly held out one hand entreatingly while she dried her eyes with the other please stay she said and please light your cigarette and please draw your chair near the fire and make yourself as comfortable or as little uncomfortable as you can forgive me i do not often break down in this way do i martin no answered martin moving the lamp so as to throw his mother's tear-stained face into shadow and then squeezing his own chair into the corner beside hers no you were cheerful enough with butcher well of course one had either to take butcher from the ludicrous side or else shoot him through the head and have done with him i see said owen nodding and not sorry to hide his own emotion under cover of a joke and mrs bransby was unable to make up her mind to justifiably homicide him yes he was a beast though and no mistake phoebe was in such a rage with him once that she threatened to throw a hot batter pudding at his head i'm sorry now she didn't added martin with pensive regret then they talked quietly mrs bransby with womanly tact led owen to speak about himself and his prospects there was little to tell in the way of incident he had been working steadily and did not dislike his work and he had been well contented with his treatment by mr bragg mr bragg had made him an offer to send him in the spring to buenos aires it might be an opening to fortune i suppose you will go of course you will go said mrs bransby she could not help her voice and her face betraying some disappointment they did not however betray all she felt for the prospect of owen's going away so soon sent a desolate chill to her heart owen looked at her quickly and then as quickly looked away and tossed the end of his cigarette into the fire before lighting another i don't know he answered bending down over the flame it will require some consideration i believe the alternative is open to me of remaining in mr bragg's employment in england anyway there is time enough before i need decide several months i hope mrs bransby breathed a low sigh of relief then she said in a perceptibly more cheerful tone it seems so odd to think of you writing business letters and making up accounts and being altogether turned into a a a clerk no not precisely that you're mr bragg's secretary are you not what i am aiming at what i hope to be is a clerk you know if i called myself a field marshal or an archbishop it would not alter the fact but it does seem odd to me too when i think of it better luck than i deserve as my shrewd old friend mrs dobbs said to me talking of mrs dobbs may cheffington came to see me here owen had heard regularly from may every week he carried her last letter in his breast pocket at that moment not the note which she had posted herself that had not yet reached collingwood terrace so that he was not starving for news of her nevertheless he felt a wild temptation to cry out tell me about her talk of nothing else but he answered composedly that was quite right she ought of course to come see you she only came once observed martin that was not her fault said his mother she could not as i told you make frequent journeys here she could not command her time or her aunt's servants she goes out a great deal her aunt lives for the world you see said owen apologetically oh there is no reason why may should not enjoy her youth and all her advantages answered mrs bransby softly she is a very sweet lovable creature much too good for mrs bransby here checked herself and stopped abruptly oh mother that's all bosh cried martin flushing hotly i mean that notion of yours now i ask you mr rivers is it likely that may cheffington would think of marrying theodore ah you may well look flabbergasted anybody would who knew them both you see mother mr rivers takes it just as i did you don't think it likely do you mr rivers owen had recovered from the first startling effect of hearing those two names coupled together but he was inwardly raging and lavishing a variety of the most unparliamentary epithets on theodore if you ask my candid opinion i don't think it likely he answered curtly of course not exclaimed the boy it's only theodore's bounce i told mother so why you don't mean that bransby has the confounded impudence to say no no interposed mrs bransby don't let us exaggerate theodore has never made any explicit statement on the subject but he meets may very frequently in society he is constantly invited by mrs dormer smith they are thrown a great deal together may has evidently become much more kind and gracious to him of late for i remember when she used positively to run away from him and as for him he is as much attached to her as he can be to any human being i do believe that 
attached your granny cried martin apparently unable to find a polite phrase strong enough to convey his deep disdain theodore is much attached to number one and that's about the beginning and the end of his attachments hush martin said his mother severely you are talking of what you don't understand and you know how much i dislike to hear you use that tone about your your brother she brought out the word brother with an obvious effort in truth she had a repugnance to speaking or even thinking of theodore as her children's brother but it was a repugnance for which she blamed herself i think she added that you had better go to bed martin the boy rose with an instant obedience which had not always characterized him in the happy old chester days and bent over his mother to kiss her i'm very sorry i did not mean to vex you mother he whispered you're not angry with me are you i can't be angry with you my darling boy but i must do my duty you know he would say i was right to correct you martin lifted up his face cheerfully with the happy elasticity of boyish spirits all right mother good night good night mr rivers good night old fellow responded owen grasping the boy's hand heartily he felt very strongly in sympathy with martin just then martin lingered may i ask just one thing mother he said wistfully you know we agreed not to tease mr rivers with our affairs immediately on his arrival martin replied his mother then unable to resist his pleading faith she said if it really is only one question perhaps mr rivers would not mind what is it you want to know martin speak out said owen it's about the question i asked in my letter replied martin blushing and eager don't you think i ought to try and help mother and don't you think i might have a chance of earning something that's two questions said owen with a smile but i'll answer them both to number one yes undoubtedly to number two perhaps but we must have patience there mother cried martin triumphantly turning his glowing face and sparkling eyes towards her then he shut the door and rushed upstairs his round young cheeks dimpled with smiles and his heart so full of joyous hopes that he was impelled to find some vent for his overflowing spirits by hurling his bolster at bobby and billy who were sitting up in bed broad awake thereupon there ensued smothered sounds of scuffling and laughter mingled with the occasional thud of a bolster against the wall until phoebe sharply rapping at the door announced that unless mr martin was in bed in two minutes she would take away the light and leave him to undress in the dark when the widow was alone with owen she began to pour forth the praises of her eldest boy she hoped mr rivers did not think her selfish in letting the boy share so much of her cares and anxieties but although only a child in years he was so helpful so loving so sensible had such a manly desire to shield her and spare her and then after asking owen's advice about the boy she added naively only please don't advise me to make a drudge of him he is so clever he ought to be educated his dear father looked forward to his doing so well at school and college if i am to advise really said owen i ought first to understand the state of the case with as much accuracy as possible mrs bransby at once told him the details of her circumstances as succinctly as she could there was a small sum secured to her but so small as barely to suffice for finding them all in food theodore had made himself responsible for the rent during one twelvemonth he had also or so she had understood him promised to send martin to his old school for a couple of years but it now appeared that his offer was limited to paying for martin's being taught at a neighbouring day school of a very inferior kind and even this seemed precarious i thought at one time said mrs bransby that i might perhaps earn a little money by teaching but i must do what i can to educate ethel and enid and the younger boys until they get beyond me i fear i could not find time to go out and give lessons even if i succeeded in getting an engagement so i am trying to get some sewing to do i can use my needle you know while i hear ethel say her french lesson and make bobby and billy spell words of two syllables poor mrs bransby spoke with much diffidence of her plans and projects she had a very humble opinion of her own powers and was touchingly willing to be ruled and directed owen suggested that it might have been better for her to have remained in oldchester where she was among friends but she answered that she had scarcely had any choice in the matter it was theodore who had decided that she was to remove to london it was theodore who had chosen that house for her in the first days of her loss she had blindly accepted all theodore's directions perhaps i was to blame she said but i was so overwhelmed and i felt so helpless and it seemed right to listen to theodore but although i never say a harsh word about him to strangers nor to the children if i can help it i cannot pretend to you who know us all so well that he is kind to us martin resents his behaviour very much i do my best but it is impossible to make my boy feel cordially towards his half-brother of course it is said owen then he closed his lips he would not trust himself to talk of theodore at that moment 
it was a comfort to mrs bransby to speak openly to a sympathizing listener and one whom she could thoroughly trust she talked on for a long time and at length looking at her watch accused herself of selfishness in keeping owen so long from the rest which he must need after his journey as she returned the watch to her pocket she said deprecatingly perhaps you think i ought not to possess so handsome a watch under the present circumstances theodore was quite displeased when he saw it and said it ought to be sold but you see i need some kind of watch and this is an excellent timekeeper and and my dear husband gave it to me on the last birthday we spent together she turned away to hide the tears that brimmed up into her eyes and going to a little side table lit her chamber candle owen rose from his chair look here mrs bransby he said of course we must have more talk together and more time to consider matters but it seems to me that martin is right in wishing to earn something young as he is it might be possible to find some employment for him which should bring in a weekly sum worth having and as to his education it has occurred to me that i could at least keep him from forgetting what he has learnt already and perhaps coach him on a little further an hour or two every evening steadily occupied would do a good deal it would be a great pleasure to me to be able to do this small service for you that is to say he went on quickly in order to check the outburst of thanks which trembled on her lips if you are good enough to allow me the advantage of continuing to occupy a room here i hope you will be able to put up with me i don't think that phoebe will want to throw a hot batter pudding at my head but that may be my vanity good night do not say any more now please we will think it over on both sides i will smoke one more cigarette if i may before i turn in he opened the door and held it open for her as she passed him she paused an instant and said in a low trembling voice god bless you End of chapter 4